church. We want to welcome everybody to our online service. Uh, we're thankful for uh, everybody that has joined us. We're going to have a couple of different things. We'll have some uh, special singing and things of that nature and then a, a message in a little while. Uh, but we're thankful you've decided to join us today. And uh, our prayer is that uh, the Lord is able to minister to each and every one of us uh, while we're here. Uh, so uh, we hope that you enjoy the service. Morning, church. If you like, sing along with us. We're singing the hymn song, In the Garden. In the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me. I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is called talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. The nails 
that held him set me free his life for mine his life for mine how could it ever be that he would die God's son would die to save me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me church family. Uh, we're thankful that you've decided to join us today on this video uh, church service, uh, worship service. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Revelation chapter number one uh, this morning. A uh, section of scripture I've preached on at Tabernacle before. It'll be a different message, but uh, same uh, verses this morning. I think it'll apply to us. I feel the Lord has led me here and um, not just applying to, to us and in individuals, but our entire country, the body of Christ. And uh, I think that we can draw from it some encouragement and some hope in, in these uh, days. As, as we know, the governor has uh, placed limitations uh, on gathering uh, the, the stay-at-home order for 30 days. We're praying that God would uh, supernaturally move the hearts of men and that as, as he, we have hope that he's going to uh, cure and send uh, send us some relief during this time concerning the coronavirus. We're praying that it happens soon enough that our governor will uh, allow us to meet back for church at a sooner date than in 30 days. But e anyway, uh, we're thankful that we have this opportunity and that we can still worship together, look into the Word of God together. And uh, so uh, we're going to ask you, like I said, uh, Revelation chapter number one. I'm going to read one verse. We'll have a time of uh, prayer uh, and then we'll get into the rest of the message. Revelation chapter number one. And um, we're going to start in verse nine. Bible says, I, John, 
who also am your brother and a companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, church. God in heaven, we thank you for today, for your goodness and love. Lord, the opportunity we have to worship you, to look into your word, to be moved uh, uh, in spirit as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that uh, you would send us an understanding, that you would send us encouragement, that you would send us conviction, that you would send us hope, uh, whatever it is that we stand in need of. This morning, Lord, we're praying that you would provide it for, uh, uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the preaching of your word. Lord, help me not to be a powerless preacher, but help me to be yielded and, uh, to the power and moving of the Holy Spirit himself. We ask these things in your blessed and holy name. Amen. We recognize here, uh, this is John that is speaking. John, it says, is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, uh, in uh, what we're, the verse we're going to look at in a second. Uh, and, and I wanted to ask you the question this morning to start off with. Have you ever felt as though you were in the Spirit, uh, maybe when you weren't in a church service uh, uh, in any way whatsoever. I know uh, in my life I've experienced that a handful of times. I know uh, I've been driving down the road listening to, to gospel music or listening to a sermon or, or something of that nature and the, uh, it feels as though the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me and it makes me want to shout and you know I get uh, goosebumps all over and uh, just feeling the, the presence and the power of God. It can happen, uh, like I said, in a car just driving down the road and uh, uh, have you ever experienced anything like that? Have you ever uh, felt as though you were in the presence of the Holy Spirit and uh, that uh, you were in the Spirit as far as Him moving in your life and speaking to you in a time of prayer? I hope that you have. Uh, that's one of the, the benefits and the greatest aspects of prayer is that interaction and the recognition that God Almighty is with us. And so uh, I hope that you have. I, I've experienced uh, uh, times of, uh, of fellowship with other Christians where we've been talking about uh, things in Scripture and what the Lord's doing. And I felt the, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit during that time or even during a time of witnessing. Have you ever felt as though that you were in the Spirit, uh, in His presence, and uh, being moved and spoken to by uh, the Holy Spirit of God outside of being in a church service? John has. John identifies himself in verse 9. Uh, he identifies himself as the author of this, uh, uh, of this specific book. We know uh, that he is an apostle of Christ. He is a disciple of Christ, a servant of Christ. And he identifies himself in verse 9 uh, as a brother in Christ, a uh, part of the body of Christ. John was in exile on a small island as a punishment, he says in verse 9, uh, for preaching uh, the gospel and preaching Christ. This is where we pick up as, as we're going to go forward. Verse 10, uh, after he, he addresses himself and addresses uh, the brethren, that's who he's talking to, uh, he gives us an understanding of what's going on in his life at this moment. <clears throat> verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, unto, uh, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and uh, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto bra a fine brass, had, uh, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand, or he had uh, in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, 
I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. We see, uh, as John, uh, the first thing it says, he is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. As he is addressing the brethren, and as he is, uh, we're going to see, he is doing what uh, God is uh, leading him to do. But he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, uh, as if it was a trumpet. Uh, we see in these verses uh, that it is possible, first of all, to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, whether you are in church or not. And we'll get to that at the end. Uh, we hope that you uh, stick with us till the end, but uh, we'll get to that uh, after a while. But the, the Bible says here uh, that we can be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day uh, when we are not uh, uh, technically inside the four walls of the church. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and uh, he gives us an understanding of what can happen, what will happen, uh, what we have the opportunity of happening in our our life if we'll put ourselves in the position of being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. The first thing we recognize that John says uh, is that uh, he heard a voice. When we are in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, we have the opportunity of hearing a voice. This is the voice of the Lord. We recognize uh, uh, him uh, in verse 11. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Uh, what thou seest, uh, write in a book, send it to the seven churches. Uh, and then he gives a list of the seven churches that he's writing. Uh, we see here, first of all, that he hears a voice. It's a voice of authority. The Alpha and the Omega, the uh, creator of all things, the one who will endure uh, for all time. He's absolutely eternal, absolutely all-powerful. It's a voice of authority. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. This voice also is a voice of instruction. He says what it is that you're about to hear, what it is you see, what it is you receive from me, I want you to write it to the churches that are in Asia. This is a voice of instruction. When we are in the Spirit on the Lord's day, uh, we'll hear the voice of authority, Almighty God speaking to us through the Holy Spirit through His Word. Uh, it'll give us instructions as to who and what it is that He wants us to be, how it is He wants us to serve. But we'll also, uh, with this uh, hearing of a voice, we'll, uh, we'll recognize, it, recognize it as a voice of concern. He wants John to write to the, uh, to the churches for the purpose of addressing issues that are inside the churches. He's concerned with the fallout. He's concerned with the direction that they're heading. He knows where it'll, where it'll end and where it'll lead. And so he has John write these letters to encourage them to get back to serving him the way that they're supposed to. This is the voice that John heard, and it's a voice that we can hear, whether we're able to meet at church this Sunday or for the next 30 days, whether we're able to meet or not, we can be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And if we are in the Spirit on the Lord's day, we can hear His voice as He speaks to us. We also see that John didn't just hear a voice, but he also uh, saw a vision. It was a vision of royalty. Verse 13 uh, or 12 says that he turned to see the voice uh, and when he was turned, it was, uh, uh, he saw the seven golden candlesticks in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, girded about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 13 gives us an understanding that this vision that he saw uh, being God as he's turned to hear or to see the voice that he, uh, that he heard, he sees a vision of royalty. Uh, we see uh, if you go uh, verse 20, we recognize that the uh, seven stars that are mentioned in our reading, the seven candlesticks that are mentioned in our reading uh, are, are given to us as an understanding. The, uh, the, the one that's talked about here, the candlesticks, this is uh, Jesus standing in the midst of the churches. 
In the midst of the churches, uh, churches, he is clothed with a long garment, and his uh, his chest and his stomach is is wrapped with a, a golden wrapping or a golden shield. This is a picture of absolute royalty as he's standing in the midst of the churches, having that authority, having a, uh, that that uh, uh, that royalty as they all look towards him. As, uh, he saw a vision of royalty. He also saw as he sees uh, God, as he sees Jesus. Jesus, and as, uh, as he recognizes this, he sees a vision of wisdom. It talks about his head and his hair uh, being white as wool and white as snow. Uh, this being a picture of, a, of wisdom through experience. He, is, he has existed since before time uh, even existed. He has created time. Uh, he's existed uh, uh, for eternity past. He will exist in an eternity future. He's uh, absolutely all-knowing. Everything uh, being uh, known by him, uh, he has wisdom through experience. The, uh, the eyes as a flame of fire fire in verse 14, a picture of uh, that all seeing, all knowing, nothing being hidden from the eyes of God. He sees a vision of royalty, a vision of wisdom, but he also sees in verse 15 a vision of justness uh, and uh, his feet like unto br uh, fine brass as they burned in a furnace and his voice as a sound of many waters. This justness that is uh, that he's seeing here, uh, his feet as brass in the furnace, a picture uh, of strength and stability uh, and supremacy as he is, uh, he is the all-seeing, all-knowing uh, royal judge of all of humanity. Uh, we see all this uh, being revealed to us in verse 15, the voice of many waters. This voice of many waters is uh, giving us an understanding of uh, the force and the volume by which he is being heard. Nothing uh, can overpower and nothing is, is stronger as he uh, hears the voice of many waters. Verse 16, a vision of glory. And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. He sees a vision of royalty, wisdom, justness, and he sees a, a vision of glory. We see him here holding the pastor's hands as they are doing uh, what they can to lead and instruct the church. This is a voice of absolute truth. As is uh, the voice uh, and what he sees, a sharp two-edged sword coming uh, from his mouth, uh, speaking of the Word of God. And uh, we know as he's talking about being a judge and everything being judged by what thus saith the Lord. His voice is a voice of absolute truth. His countenance was as a sun shining in his strength. We see here his holiness radiating as a light of purity and sinlessness. So as John is uh, in the uh, Spirit on the Lord's day, he hears a voice, a voice that calls unto him, a voice of authority, instruction, and concern as far as the churches uh, that, that he calls him to write to. We see as he turns to see this voice, uh, this vision that he has of royalty, wisdom, justness, and glory, he sees uh, Almighty God, he sees Jesus, he recognizes all these different things about who and what he is just by viewing him. But we see it doesn't just stop there. Verses 17 and 18 uh, tells us that if we are in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, whether we're inside the four walls of this church or not, we'll hear His voice, uh, we'll see a vision of who He is, but we'll also have the opportunity of feeling a touch. He felt a, a touch. Verse 17, And when I saw Him, I felt His feet as if dead. Now, uh, we see that happening all throughout Scripture. When an individual comes in contact with God, the natural response, the natural reaction is for them to fall at His feet as if they are dead or uh, in the position of worship. When, uh, when we recognize who and what God is, when we can see Him in His glory and in His justness, and when we can recognize uh, that vision of wisdom and royalty, when we see Jesus truly for what He is, it'll put us in the place of worship. You'll feel a touch. He says, uh, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, his hand of power and authority, and saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. 
and have the keys of hell and death. This uh, touch that he felt was a touch of comfort. Fear not. As you fall uh, uh, at my feet uh, to worship and as you are uh, there in praise and in adoration and, uh, and you are all consumed with, uh, with who I am and it puts you in that position, don't be afraid. It's comforting when the all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God places His hand on you and says you have nothing to fear. Fear not. I am the first and the last. It's not just a touch of comfort, but a touch of conviction. What it is that's brought you to the place of fear, uh, what it is that, that grips you, what it is that, uh, that, that makes you so afraid, understand I am uh, here. I am with you. I am the first and the last. Uh, I am the one that is calling. I am the one that is leading. I am the one that is in control. If anything causes us to be in that position of fear, it should not just be comforting to us, but convicting when we hear the words of God saying unto us, fear not because I am with you. If he's with us all the time, if we have that assurance of God with us, what is it we have to fear? It gives us uh, the idea or it gives us an understanding of just how small our faith can be at sometimes. Yeah, this coronavirus is uh, sweeping over the world and taking everybody seemingly uh, hostage to fear. But is God in control or is he not in control? Did he have all this uh, in his infinite wisdom? Did he have the knowledge of what all of us were going to go through or did he not have that knowledge? Does he have the power and ability uh, to execute judgment and to move mountains to perform miracles on behalf of his people or does he not? So why are we afraid? There's a touch of comfort, conviction. There's also a touch of passion, uh, compassion. I am he that liveth and was dead and am alive forevermore. He says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm the first and the last. Then he's compassionate towards, uh, uh, towards John and he, he, he reminds, them, uh, reminds John and he reminds all of us uh, of his uh, being in control, of knowing what it is to, uh, to suffer through this life, to know what it is, uh, in John's case, even to be exiled, to know what it is uh, to be tempted, to know what it is uh, to be persecuted, to know what it is uh, to be put in the position uh, where, uh, where uh, other individuals uh, have the opportunity of, of even taking your life. Uh, that, that it was very real and understood by Jesus. Uh, but he says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Look, John, I want you to understand this. I love you. I have a desire to see uh, you glorified. I have a desire to see you used. I have a desire to, uh, to, uh, to work on your behalf. Don't be afraid. Because the one that you are serving, the one that you are at my feet worshiping at this time, I am the one that was dead and is alive forevermore. I've got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Uh, it was a touch of compassion, but also uh, this, uh, as he places his right hand on uh, John, it was a touch of control. I've got this. No matter how bad things may get, I've got this, John. When you're in the Spirit on the Lord's day, you'll hear a voice. You'll see a vision. You'll feel a touch. And verse 19 gives us an understanding that you'll receive a call. If God is speaking, if God is present with us, if we can see Him in all that He is, if He places His hand on us and touches us and, and brings us that comfort, it's not just so that we could have a little bit of fire insurance or that just that we can have just a little bit of hope to get us through. God has left us here in this life. God has left us here on this planet at this time because He has a job for us to do. If you go back to the first thing uh, that Jesus said to John, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, uh, what thou seest, write in a book and send it to all these churches. Then he says again in verse 19, Write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and 
the things which shall be hereafter. He tells John to get up and get busy. Worship. Is amazing. Worship is awesome. Praising, uh, praising the Lord and spending that time with Him is absolutely overwhelmingly amazing. But uh, we see Jesus in His great commission telling, uh, telling His believers to go. We see it uh, all throughout Scripture, uh, especially in the New Testament. God's people, His disciples, His apostles, uh, the, the uh, leaders of the church to go and to reach communities. And uh, He's telling uh, John here to get busy serving me. Get busy doing what it is I've called you to do. Get busy about my work. Don't be consumed with the fact that you're exiled. Don't be consumed with the fact that you're put in this position of fear and uncertainty. Don't be consumed with the, uh, the dread and the fear that is before you. Just get busy doing my work and trust that I'll take care of the rest. Get up and get busy. Now I know that uh, based on what our governor has said and based on what our nation and our world is going through, getting out and door knocking and getting out and uh, doing that sort of uh, verbal witnessing is, uh, it can be limited at times. I mean, it's not always the best thing to have that kind of close personal interaction with others. Now, if the Holy Spirit is leading you to witness to somebody at your grocery store or, or something like that, that's different uh, as far as uh, person to person is concerned. But just in the same way that God has given us the opportunity opportunity uh, through social media and uh, things of that nature to, uh, to have this church service, this worship service. We have uh, so many different forms and so many different avenues uh, that, that John and the apostles and the New Testament uh, believers uh, uh, there uh, through uh, from Matthew to Revelation, they didn't have the same opportunities that we have. If we've been put in this position, don't we recognize that uh, God is doing all things for our good and His glory? We have this time, this opportunity to let our voice be heard in different ways. And it's, uh, it's God's desire as we are worshiping Him, recognizing Him, seeing Him in all of His goodness, all of His greatness, hearing His voice, being moved and being called. It's important for us to capitalize on every opportunity we have, not just to worship Him, but to get busy about His work. To be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day is a choice. We don't have to physically be, as I've said, uh, in the church building for this to take place, to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. We know that the church building is exemplified and uh, is glorified throughout Scripture, uh, throughout God's Word. We know that uh, it's a special place. Uh, it's uh, uh, because it is uh, specifically set aside or sanctified for the purpose of uh, reverence and worship and praise of Almighty God. We know that the church is, uh, that there is a, a command for us to assemble together. We looked at that this last Wednesday evening. It's a place of praise. It's a place of uh, preaching. It's a place of uh, sacrifice. It's a place of change, of comfort. It's a place of learning. And in the life of every Christian, it's a place of necessity. Church is not just a good thing. Church is a great thing. It's for our good and should be a uh, focus of our faithfulness and dedication to the Lord as His people, as his children. I want you to listen uh, to what I'm about to say very carefully because I'm going to say it uh, very carefully. We don't have to be within the four walls of the church to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Oh, it definitely helps uh, but uh, uh, for to us to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, but we don't have to be within the four walls of the church to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. To be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day is a choice that we can make. This is not an excuse to choose to skip church. Understand that. What I'm saying is not an excuse for us to choose to miss church. But is it, it is an assurance that while we are not able to physically meet together, we have the choice of still being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. 
John gave us an understanding of what is possible when we choose to be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. So this is what we're going to close out with as far as a challenge. Are you, right now, today, are you in the Spirit? This is the Lord's Day. This is Sunday. Are you in the Spirit on the Lord's Day? If not, why not? If it's a choice, if it's an option that God has made available to us, if we are not in the Spirit on the Lord's Day... Why not? It's not because we're not in our physical church building. It's not because we're not surrounded by other believers. If we're not in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, why not? We've got to ask ourselves, is there anything in my life that's keeping me from being in the Spirit today? Are you in the Spirit on the Lord's Day? If not, why not? If so, if you can feel uh, the presence of God, if you can feel His Spirit moving, if He is speaking to you, I want to ask uh, uh, concerning the four things we looked at this morning, what is it that you hear? What are you hearing from the Spirit? What is it that you see? Are you seeing God high and lifted up? Are you seeing Him in all of His greatness? And in return, do you recognize uh, how far you fall short of His glory? What do you hear? What do you see? Number three, what do you feel? Do you feel Him moving in your life? Do you feel His, His presence and power? Do you feel his, his arm of comfort? Or do you feel that He is leading you to a place of getting some things right? What is it that He's calling you to do today? And lastly, are you in the Spirit on the Lord's Day? If not, why not? If so, what is it you hear, see, feel, and what is it He's calling you to do? And number four, how are you going to respond today? How are you going to respond to the moving of the Holy Spirit? How are you going to respond to, uh, to, uh, to seeing Him in all of His glory, to hearing uh, His voice, His message? How is it you're going to respond uh, to what it is that you feel as when He's moving in your life? Are you going to respond with obedience are you going to respond with, with, uh, with, uh, with dedication? Are you going to respond by, uh, by uh, refusing to be afraid? Are you going to respond by being obedient to what it is that He's called you to do and what it is that He's called you to be? During this time as we are separated, I want you to ask yourself, can I continue to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day? Can I be in the Spirit? Am I in the Spirit? Am I living a life in the Spirit? What is it that He's saying? What is it that He's doing in my life? And how is it that I'm going to respond?